Margaret Ellen Fox was born on February 4, 1960. She enjoyed riding horses and graduated from St. Paul's School in Burlington, New Jersey in 1974 and lived with her siblings and parents at 224 Penn Street. A few weeks after completing 8th grade at 14 years old, Margaret and her 11-year-old cousin Lynn Park placed ads in the paper advertising babysitting services. Soon after, on June 19, 1974, a man who called himself John Marshall called Lynn and explained that he was interested. He told her he had a backyard swimming pool and a swing set at his home in Mount Holly. Lynn's parents would not allow her to go to the Marshall's home, so she gave her cousin Margaret his contact information. John said he would pay her $40 a week to babysit his five-year-old son. Although he postponed meeting with her several times, he finally committed to a meeting date. He said that either he or his wife would be in a red Volkswagen. However, he called again and told Margaret's dad, who answered the phone that time, that he had to reschedule due to the death of his mother-in-law. Judging by the man's voice, her dad thought he was around 35 to 45 years old. Margaret's trip to Mount Holly was postponed once again until Monday, June 24th. Strangely, he never supplied his address to Margaret or her parents. On June 24th, she planned to take a bus to Mill and Main Streets in Mount Holly, which was eight miles from her home, to have an interview with the man about the babysitting job. One of her siblings went to the bus stop with her and witnessed her getting on the bus. She left home with her purse, a bathing suit for swimming in the Marshall's pool, and her Huckleberry Hound eyeglass case. One passenger remembered sitting behind Margaret on the bus and briefly chatted with her. Witnesses reported seeing her near Mill and High Streets after she got off the bus in Mount Holly. Margaret had been told to call home as soon as she arrived at the man's home, but that call never came. She was supposed to get a ride back home from either John or his wife, but when she didn't show up at 2.30 p.m., her parents became very worried. John had given Margaret a telephone number to reach him, and the number was traced to a phone booth in front of a Route 38 supermarket in Lumberton, New Jersey. Investigators at the time did not believe a legitimate person seeking a babysitter would have given a payphone as their callback number. In the hours after Margaret was reported missing, police started recording all phone calls placed to her home. One was from a man who has never been identified who demanded $10,000 for Margaret's safe return. He stated, $10,000 might be a lot of bread, but your daughter's life is the buttered topping. Here is a recording of the actual call. $10,000 might be a lot of bread, but your daughter's life is the buttered topping. Who is it? A note arrived about a day after this, and the man gave specific instructions as to how the money should be given. He said the money should be put in a box with blue wrapping. This is also the same color as her blouse she was wearing. He also said Margaret was okay and that we only tore her blouse and broke her glasses. Her parents quickly withdrew the money but received no instructions on how to deliver it and two days later, on June 30th, a second letter arrived that said $10,000 was a lot of bread, but your daughter's life was the buttered topping, noting the past tense. According to the FBI, the letter indicated that the ransom exchange was off because the parents had goofed in making the arrangements. It ended with so long again and the S, L, and A were highlighted. SLA were the initials of the Seminese Liberation Army, a terrorist organization famous for kidnapping Patty Hearst earlier that same year. They were not known to be active in New Jersey, but were in the news around the time of her disappearance. Investigators doubted the SLA's involvement in Margaret's disappearance. Police believe either the kidnapper or a prankster mentioned SLA because the group was frequently in the news. After the second letter arrived, there was no further communication and it was never determined if the call and the letters were legit or a hoax. FBI examiners took fingerprints from the note and compared them to local collections of prints but to no avail. Newer generations of investigators hoped to locate the prints and put them in the national database for comparison, but at some point they went missing along with Margaret's dental records. It's possible the note was a hoax, but they haven't ruled anything out. 
A detective canvassed Mount Holly's downtown area, showing Margaret's photo to approximately 200 people. Fellow officers also attempted to work every angle of the case and found their first suspect an employee at the A&P supermarket named John Marshall. Marshall was eventually cleared after his alibi checked out and he passed a polygraph exam. Some investigators remained suspicious since polygraph testing isn't always conclusive. However, others believe the true criminal wouldn't have given his real name. Margaret has never been heard from again, and John Marshall has never been identified. Several other parents in the area complained that someone had attempted to lure their daughters with fake job offers. Also, several women reported being accosted by a man in a red Volkswagen. A man driving a car matching that description had attempted to pick up a girl in Mount Holly in May. A sketch of the man was later released in August. A sex offender who had owned a red Volkswagen at the time and lived close to where Margaret was last seen was questioned and cleared four years later. In 1976, a man confessed to her kidnapping, but it later turned out to be a hoax because he had been confined to a hospital the day she disappeared. Her parents are now deceased, but her siblings are still alive and some still live in the Burlington area. No arrests have ever been made in her disappearance, and as of today, this case remains unsolved. Five-year-old Dulce Maria Alaves went missing on September 16, 2019 from Bridgeton City Park in Bridgeton, New Jersey. Her mother, Noema Alaves Perez, along with her sister, had taken Dulce and her three-year-old little brother Manuel to the park that day to play. On the way to the park, they stopped at a convenience store and bought ice cream for a snack. They arrived at the park shortly after 4 p.m. and the two children ran to go play on the swings. Noema and her sister remained in the car while Dulce and Manuel played on the playground about 30 yards away. She was checking a scratch-off lottery ticket while her 8-year-old sister was doing homework. About 20 minutes later, Manuel ran up to the car crying. His ice cream was lying on the ground, and when she asked him where Dulce was, he pointed at the spot where he last saw her. The coconut water ice she had with her was also missing. After calling her brother who lived nearby, she then called the police at 4.51 p.m. Within minutes, police arrived to the park and started gathering clues and interviewing what few immediate witnesses they could find. Investigators would start a large search for the child and conduct interviews. After interviewing witnesses at the park, police got a description of a suspect described as light-skinned, possibly Hispanic, about 5'6 to 5'8, with a thin build. He had acne on his chin and was wearing a black shirt, red pants, and orange sneakers, possibly Nike brand. He put Dulcie in a red van with a sliding door and tinted windows and left the park with her. A day after Dulcie was kidnapped, an Amber Alert was issued looking for a man in a red van. According to authorities, nothing has ever been found and no red van has ever been located that could be connected to her disappearance. Over time, they have conducted thousands of interviews and processed thousands of hours of video frame by frame in hopes of finding any important clues in the case. At the time she went missing, she and Manuel didn't live with their mother, but lived with their grandparents instead. Noema, who was pregnant, lived in a room at a residence nearby. She was only 14 years old when Dulce was born, and she shared joint custody of her and Manuel with her parents. Dulce's father was in Mexico at the time of her disappearance and had not been a part of her life since he had moved there when she was three. Neither her father, her mother, nor any other members of Dulcie's family have been named as a suspect in her case. Noema admits that for some time, her children were completely out of her sight due to a heel partially blocking her view of them while they played. She has said she regrets losing view of them on a daily basis. This is the last image of Dulcie taken as they stopped at the store to get ice cream on the way to the park. Authorities believe Dulce may have been abducted by an opportunistic predator at the park. Jackie Rodriguez, who helped the family with media coverage and searches, said at times she felt the community could be withholding information due to immigration concerns. Sadly, Dulce had just started kindergarten about a week prior to her disappearance. 
To this day, she has never been found and the case remains unsolved. Stephen DeVaris Jr. was 32 years old when he was last seen by his family on July 6, 2005 in Secaucus, New Jersey. He told his parents he was going to the Jersey Shore, but instead he bought a one-way plane ticket to Ireland. He would fly from New York City to Dublin, Ireland on July 8, 2005. While this might seem strange, he had actually been to Ireland several times before and has Irish relatives that live there. He was seen at a pub in Ina, County Clare after he arrived in Ireland. On July 12th, a man found his rucksack washed up on a beach at Seafield Quilty. His cell phone, clothing, passport, and ID were still inside the bag, but there was no sign of Stephen. The man who found the bag took it home, and his wife transferred the SIM card from the water-damaged phone to her own phone. A couple days later, Stephen's parents called to check on him and were surprised when a stranger answered the call. It was only then that they realized he had gone to Ireland instead of Jersey Shore like he said he was. After his disappearance, his rental car was found parked at the Cliffs of Mower. This led his family to believe that he might have taken his own life at that location. Although he had no debts, no problems with substance abuse, and no history of depression, he had lost his job several months before he went missing and had become very moody and withdrawn. His mother stated, Steve was a good young man. He wasn't on drugs, didn't have any debts, wouldn't hurt a bug, and he was a very sensitive, caring person. She also stated, he grew up in an Irish environment, as his Roscommon grandmother was a big part of his early childhood and teenage years. Steve always said that he loved Ireland. Stephen's parents and the couple who found his bag have kept in touch over the years through Christmas cards and even met one another in Ireland 11 years later. Stephen was declared legally dead in May 2016, but his body has never been recovered. The whereabouts and details leading up to his disappearance still remain a mystery and the case remains unsolved. Margaret Haddikin McEnroe was born August 25, 1977, and her teenage mother gave her up for adoption. Her name at the time was Sherwood Haley, a combination of her mother's maiden name and her biological father's name. She was adopted and grew up as the oldest of four adopted children in Warren Township, New Jersey. She enlisted in the Army following 9-11, and for two years she was stationed as a tank mechanic in Fort Riley, Kansas. During her time in the Army, she searched for her birth mother and found her and they became very close. She also made contact with her biological father, but lost touch shortly after Hurricane Katrina. Margaret discharged from the Army in 2004 for medical reasons and married Timothy McEnroe. She had three daughters, two with her husband and one from a previous relationship. On October 9, 2006, she had an argument with her husband and police were called to their home on a report of domestic disturbance. By the time the officers arrived, Margaret had left for her parents' house, but she returned later that evening. The next morning, she spoke to her best friend on the phone and everything seemed normal. However, at approximately 1.30 that afternoon, her husband left to go run errands, and when he returned at 3 p.m., Margaret was nowhere to be seen, and their six-month-old daughter was home alone in her crib. Her vehicle and cell phone were left behind. The cell phone had been broken the night before during the argument with her husband. Margaret may have been carrying additional clothing and identification under her birth name, Sherwood Haley, in a black duffel bag at the time of her disappearance. Her husband stated $11,000 in cash disappeared from their home at the same time she did, and she may have taken the money with her. She is known to have been carrying one credit card, but there has been no activity on that account. There has also been no activity on her bank account either. Her husband stated that she had left home for short periods of time in the past, which is why he did not report her missing for two days. Her husband apparently did not call Margaret's parents looking for her or tell them that she was missing. They found out by the police a week later. One of Margaret's Army t-shirts was found on Doc Watch Hollow Road, about a mile from her home, on Thanksgiving Day in 2006, six weeks after her disappearance. 
It was sent to a lab for analysis, but the testing did not turn up anything useful. The shirt was not weathered, indicating it had not been exposed to the elements for very long. Her family says the couple was having marital problems around the time she disappeared, and she was considering a divorce. On June 7, 2011, her husband was named a person of interest after authorities interviewed potential witnesses and neighbors near the family's home. Many people speculate that the t-shirt was planted later to try and throw off investigators' trail, especially since it was placed in an area that had previously been searched. Investigators could never confirm the $11,000 even existed, and many people speculate that it never did. Her co-workers and family members stated she was behaving normally prior to her disappearance. Friends and family also don't believe she would have left without telling someone, nor would she leave her three kids behind. As of today, no arrests have been made, and this case remains unsolved. Benita Karen Sanders was born on September 17, 1984, and nicknamed Little Nita. According to her mother, who is also named Benita, her daughter was last seen strapped in her stroller on the porch of her family's home. She lived in the Virginia Court Apartments in the 900 block of Baltic Avenue in Atlantic City, New Jersey. At 6 p.m. on September 14, 1986, Vanita stated that little Nita was eating a popsicle and her other children were playing outside at the time. Vanita claimed that she looked outside at approximately 7 p.m. and discovered little Nita had disappeared from her stroller. Vanita claimed that she searched Baltic Avenue and the surrounding streets for her daughter, but she could not locate her. She would report Nita missing around 8.30 p.m. Investigators looked at both of Nita's parents in her disappearance. Her father, Abdul Salam, was quickly ruled out as a suspect. Although he had been seeking to gain custody of his daughter, he was in prison at the time of her disappearance for robbery. He and Benita were together for eight years, and Benita had four children during this time, two of whom were Salam's, but she and Salam never legally married. Salam has stated he never believed Benita's account of their daughter's disappearance. Benita allegedly abandoned Nita at birth in 1984 by walking out of an Atlantic City hospital and leaving her behind. However, she was not charged in that case, but she did face charges when she gave birth to a son in October 1986, one month after Nita was last seen. In October of 1986, Benita gave birth to a baby boy at the Atlantic City Medical Center where she had checked in under the alias Laura Smith. She was discharged from the hospital on October 7, 1986 and left with her newborn son. She then reportedly took a cab to an Atlantic City bus terminal where she would leave the baby lying face down in a terminal restroom before she caught a bus to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Thankfully, the infant was rescued shortly thereafter. In January 1987, Benita was sentenced to nine months in jail for endangering the welfare of a child and her three other children were placed in foster homes. She was paroled after five months, but served another 15 months when she was arrested for shoplifting baby clothes while on parole. The father of Benita's newborn son told authorities that she lied to him and said she had an abortion when she was pregnant. He did not know she had carried the baby to term and given birth until he was contacted by law enforcement. Benita had three more sons after the one she abandoned in 1986. The prosecutor in Benita's case told the court that she was uncooperative during the investigation into little Nita's disappearance. He stated that she provided false leads and also lied to authorities. Benita evidently never inquired as to the status of her daughter's case. Salam believes that his daughter was not abducted and has asked investigators to search the yard behind the Virginia Court Apartments for human remains. Authorities utilized cadaver sniffing dogs earlier in the case but could not locate any evidence in the area. Salam also stated that New Jersey's Division of Youth and Family Services was supposed to check on Little Nita's well-being prior to her disappearance at his request. However, when they arrived at the residence, no one was home. By the time they prepared for a second attempt to see Nita, she had already vanished. 
Investigators believe that Nita possibly choked to death on the popsicle stick she was holding on the day of her disappearance and was buried somewhere off the family's property. However, there is no evidence to support this theory. In 2009, authorities began searching a wooded area in Pleasantville, New Jersey for her remains. Reportedly, Benita's best friend went to police and said Benita had buried her daughter there. However, nothing was recovered at the search site. A forensic anthropologist noted that given Nita's age and the time that has passed since her disappearance, it's possible that even if her body had been there at one time, there would be no trace of it now. Benita Karen Sanders was just three days shy of turning two when she disappeared. No one has ever been arrested in her disappearance, and as of today, this case remains unsolved.